Hello there, welcome to another exciting episode of What Does YOLO Mean To Me? My name is Claudia and I play the role of Antoinette. I am your host for this episode. YOLO is a youth TV serial which deals with adolescent and productive health issues and encourages young people to adapt positive behaviours to help them live their good life. Was that one of the Wabenzis on the phone? Oh. We need cash, <laughs> <laughs> Nah, that was Auntie Anyona, man. The boutique where I buy my stuff at the flat. Oh, okay. Yeah, um, she's at the airport. She's actually on her way out of town and she wanted to find out if I knew anybody I could trust with her shop. Here on What Does YOLO Mean To Me, we get to meet you, the fans, to discuss what YOLO TV series means to you as an individual, the impact it has made on your life, as well as talk about a few adolescent and productive issues which were highlighted in the YOLO TV series. Remember, you can enjoy a good life exercising and eating a healthy diet. Also, to enjoy a good life in this COVID-19 era, we have to be cautious to stay safe. Always wash your hands with soap under running water. Do not hug or shake hands. Use hand sanitizers. Avoid touching your mouth, nose, face and ensure you maintain a physical distance of about two meters between you and others in public. Avoid crowded places. Here with me are five individuals. Let's find out who they are and what YOLO means to them. Hello, my name is Kezi Adama and I'm 19 years old. I completed Accra Girls. I studied general science and I love YOLO because of the positive information it gives us. It has built my self-confidence. I mean, I can say no when I want to say no and I can say yes when I want to say yes. My name is Akweta Patrick and uh, what I like about YOLO is the, the part that is has really educated me, like really educated me. Hamza Fidel is my name. I like Yulu because it's an educative movie and as a young girl like me I've had answers to things I couldn't get during my teens. It has given me self-confidence because through the actors in Yolo series like Emily for instance I learned to have self-confidence to say yes to something and to say no to something. My name is Lifeline Kofi Agbanakha Nunes. I study computer engineering. I love YOLO because of the positive impacts in terms of sexual education and also top characters like Drogba and that of Sio. They have been one of my motivators in YOLO. My name is Jason Essel and I like YOLO because some characters in the series, I can relate to some of them. So I, I really watch it a lot. The sexual educational part, everything you need to know about sex, yeah, I really like that part of YOLO. Today we are talking about access to information and content on adolescent sexual and reproductive health. My name is Dr. Mrs. Marsha Taylor and you can call me Auntie Marsha. I'm here to talk to you and also answer your questions about living the good life. So let's get started. As you grow, many changes will occur on our body and our mind and it's very important that we talk to a health provider or a trusted family member or perhaps a peer educator who give us some guidance. Where do you currently get information on sexual and reproductive health issues? Does it meet your needs? Uh, I get accurate information on sexual and reproductive health from school, clubs, uh, friends, friends, hospitals too, sometimes. Parents, if they are okay to talk to you about stuff like that. I get information from school clubs like Reproductive Health Club and my teachers my friends and sometimes from my parents and then books and then they impact me a lot. So I get this accurate information from most especially watching of um, these adult movies and that of uh, elderly people around me. Sometimes to personal research, I go onto the internet to watch whatever I, I think best suits me to educate myself on. Personally, um, I get mine from my brother. We are very, very close. Well, he really advises me on some things I do, and I tell him almost everything. In fact, everything that goes on in my life. So he's the, the best, best person to really advise me. So yeah, his advice meets my needs. I get information on televisions for my peers, for my parents, churches and stuff. The answers I get meet my needs. Which youth friendly centers or services where adolescents can access accurate information on sexual and reproductive health issues do you know? So I know of school clubs and uh, hospitals 
yeah, um, there are some of the places where um, adolescents can get accurate information on um, sexual reproductive health issues. Get accurate information from schools. Yeah, in my school, for instance, we have clubs which teach a lot about that. What has been your experience accessing these services? I had this uh, friend that had uh, gonorrhea and he, he couldn't go to the drugstore to get drugs, okay? And he asked me to go get them for him. And I went there and the pharmacist was, was looking at me like, what did you do? Like, how? That kind of thing. So. And I felt bad, like I regretted going to get the drugs for him. So at least, but later on I got it for him and yeah. Me for instance, my mother is quite a strict type and so telling her about my issues is quite scary. So my experience from accessing information from the internet, it wasn't quite good because it led me to a point site. Personally, I had an issue with my mom. She found packets of condom in my pockets. It became a very big issue in the house because I was very small and she didn't know what I was doing with condom. I explained myself that the condom was shared by the roadside, so I took it. I couldn't just reject it. So I, I took the condom and I, I kept it. I didn't have any intention of using it or something like that. That's why the condom was in my, in my pocket. So because of that, it was very, very difficult to talk to her about sexual reproductive issues. Um, I had a lot of issues, but I couldn't talk to her about it because of how she reacted. And any advice on how to improve these services? So I think the strictness on kids on this particular issue should be very limited. They should really reduce it because we go through a lot when it comes to sexual issues. Yeah, so the strictness should be very lim limited so that we can express ourselves very well. I would like the authorities to advise parents to have much attention and build parent-children relationship between them so we can tell them what we go through. So previously, like I said, that it led me to a porn site. I will actually advise the organizations to actually have a website so that an adolescent like me can go there and then search for it. What barriers do you face in accessing sexual reproductive health information and services? Personally, I think insecurity, shyness and um, not being able to express yourself. That is what prevents me from accessing information. Okay, uh, my barriers, I don't, I don't even have barriers. It's just the, the shyness. I'm, I'm shy to like get those kind of informations and even the people you get them from Crown, it's like, what you're going to ask, are they going to give you the right answers? Like, So the barriers I face is Mostly when I go to adults or teachers or sometimes my parents to talk about it, they, are, they just jump to the conclusion that I just want to do something bad, but then it's not like that. I just want to get information so that I can get educated. One of the barriers is fear, because me going to the hospital to inform the nurses of what I go through, I might get scared. Sometimes I get barriers as in being accused or having wrong perception towards my personality. Maybe I may look like that of a kind, but on the real, I am not. Maybe I'm just looking for an information to guide my, myself, but it may end up in someone's own perception as I'm a bad person. Are the barriers the same for boys and girls or not? Why? Yes, they are the same for boys and girls, since we are all headed towards one thing, to educate ourselves sexually and other uh, 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 reproductive education. Maybe. Maybe because girls, we are quite secretive than boys. Boys do share what they go through with peers and their parents and stuff. But girls, nah, we don't do that. <laughs> so because of that, I don't think the barriers are the same. What girls go through are different from what boys go through. We don't get pregnant. Girls get pregnant. It's a different thing altogether. I don't think the barriers are the same for boys and girls because what um, girls go through are very different from what boys go through. So the barriers are for both girls and boys. When you are going for an information from an elderly person, most of them don't listen to what you have to say. They have to come down to our level to understand us, but then they don't. And then they just jump to conclusion that we want to do something bad. 
I don't think it's the same for boys and girls. See, girls take things normal. It's easier for girls, so they take things to be normal. Like, let me go and do it. Besides, it's just answers that I'm going to get. But guys, before you even go, no, Charlie, what is the person going to think about me? Like, what the person, what's the person going to say? Those kind of things. So it's 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 not the same. Do you get sexual and reproductive health information from teachers and educational professionals? Yes, we do get. I can say I get them from educational professionals, but not from teachers. Yeah, more times. More times I get from teachers and professionals. Yes, I do take advice from teachers and professionals on sexual reproductive issues. If yes, what are some of the positive outcomes? Some get positive outcomes, that is if they put what they were taught or what they learned from them into practice. Some of the positive outcomes of taking advice from teachers and professionals is that they, they've been there, like they've experienced everything you are now about to experience. So yeah, yes, yes, they, they do know the right things to tell you. Some of the positive outcomes are through teaching. I can't boldly go to a teacher and tell him about my issues. But as he's teaching and we get to things concerning teens and productive health, I get to learn more about things concerning it. The positive outcomes that I get from my educational health professionals are privacy because whatever we discuss stays between us. Are there negative outcomes too? Share what you think. As for negative outcomes, I'm not really sure about that. Sometimes they might be having the perception like they are exploring you into a bad uh, a field. They may think that you already know it, or they may think that when they talk to you about such thing, you are going to be, you are going to engage yourself into it. So sometimes we don't really get the real content that we need to get from teachers or elderly people around us. There are negative outcomes from having information from teachers. I don't see teachers to be quite secretive. Yes, they do spread rumors about children and teenagers and stuff. So for me, telling my issue to a teacher, I would rather take it to a peer or my parents. I don't see them to be secretive. There are, there are negative outcomes. <laughs> some, some, teachers, some teachers won't answer your questions the way you want, it. You want them to answer it. Because some teachers will look down on you and be like, why, why are you asking me these kind of questions? And be, the way you are with some teachers, like the way some teachers treat you, they won't even push you to go ask them those kind of questions. You see, yeah, so there are negative sides too. How can parents and service providers create a welcoming environment for you to voice out your needs and seek advice in making smart sexual and reproductive health as well as other life choices? Parents and service providers providers should um, have an organization where peers should be able to discuss issues amongst themselves. That will help them make smart choices. I think parents should build this child-parent relationship between them and also inform teachers and other practitioners to build this relationship to allow their children to tell them more about themselves and what they go through. Maybe if she can't say it to a mother, she can say it to a teacher. Service providers too can give a platform to allow children to also air out their views on things. They can go from schools to schools, churches, anywhere to give out maybe pamphlets which can make students or in case of needs or know some petty things about themselves. So parents and service providers can create a comfortable environment for adolescents who come for information. Well, the parents, they can be open to us and they know how they need from us and tell us the whole truth. But as for service providers, they shouldn't look down upon us and they shouldn't judge us too quickly. That would be if the parents are not too straight on you, like they, they share things with you, th that way you feel comfortable to talk to them in that manner. Yeah, but if they are too strict on you, like they don't even want to, if you're a guy and they don't even want you to have female friends, uh, how are you going to share these kind of things with them? So I think parents shouldn't be so strict on their children like that. They should be free with them. Okay, I think there should be that platform where you can freely go to either your parent or someone kind of older than you, where you can seek advice on to what to do 
when you uh, encounter gonorrhea or any sexually transmitted disease, there should be that relationship between either you and your parents, you and your teachers or elderly people, people who can give you good advice. So as it is, I think we should develop proper relationship between the youth and service providers. Let's listen to what some of the youth in other parts of the country have to say about this topic. I'm Kuku Samoa, 19 years of age, a student of Blue Crest University College, and I'm currently connected from Medina. As a youth, I know of their school, peer counseling centers, and churches are places that adolescents can go to to seek SRH information. I remember I had a problem and I went to a teacher to seek for help. So there I had positive information from him which helped my life very much. Oh yes, I do get information from my teachers. I quite remember there was this one time I seeked a teacher for information and the information I got really helped me a lot and it really changed my life positively. You are pregnant. Have you been giving your body to one of the boys? Do you use condom? Free range, no protection. Okay. Do you think students who get pregnant should return to school after childbirth? Why? Or why not? Mm. No, especially at the side of the ladies. Why? Because you drop out of school, just be in the house and take care of your children. And then bring out more offspring. Maybe that is what you wanted to do. Yeah, I think. I think students should return to school after childbirth simply because giving birth is not a crime. So if, if you have a kid as an adolescent, you can still go back to school. I think students should go back to school after childbirth because that's not the end of life. I think students who get pregnant, especially the females, they should return to school after childbirth because that is not the end of life. I mean, they have dreams and that shouldn't be the problem why they shouldn't follow their dreams. I, I do think students should return to school after childbirth because, okay, it will depend on if they get someone to give their child to. Yeah, let's say their mothers are there. They can leave the child to the mother and go back to school. If That is only if they don't feel shy to be in school, yeah. What prevents students who have become pregnant from staying in or returning to school? What I think prevents them from returning to school is um, I think they mostly get depressed and anxiety and because of their peers in school um, everything just gets messed up, they feel bad and sometimes they even feel like committing suicide. So that's some of the reasons why adolescents don't want to return to school after childbirth. Some students refuse to go back to school due to fear, lose of confidence. They feel they've ended in life and they also fear they might lose most of their friends. So I think that's the reason why students refuse to go back to school after childbirth. Students who get pregnant go through a lot of body changes and they don't have time to take care of themselves and they are tired all the time. After the childbirth, they have to take care of their baby and themselves. So it's difficult to stay in class because they are shy. So they can't go to school. Most students, when they drop out from school, couldn't have the uh, opportunity to go back because of uh, um, fear, because of anxiety, because of uh, a whole lot of issues come up. For me, I think the reason why students can't go back to school after childbirth is uh, the way their friends are going to look at them, the way they are going to gossip behind them and make them feel bad and all those kind of things. If they think about those things, they'll be like, Child, if I go to Krana, this what is going to happen to me. They're going to talk. So I think that's what prevents them from going back to school after childbirth. How can teachers and parents support adolescent parents to go back to school? So parents can support adolescent child to go back to school after childbirth by supporting them financially. And then maybe they can take their baby from them so that they'll be able to continue with their school. And then the teachers can allow their female child to bring their baby to school. If only maybe someone can take care of their baby so that their baby won't distract their mother from learning. Teachers and parents can support adolescents to go back to school. One, 
That is, if the person is willing to go back to school, the teachers can accept maybe up to a duration. You can be bringing your child to, to school. When the child is fit, can also go to school or be in the house, you be in the house with your parents. And at the, at the side of the parents, too, they can accept the child for you to go, to go back to school. That is, if you yourself you are willing, if you know education is important and you really want to go, if you are willing, you do whatever you could to go back to school. Talking behind their backs, not making them feel bad, that's, that's what I think. Yes, teachers can help adolescent parents to go back to school by advising them, even help them to wake up what they've lost during time of pregnancy and stuff. It will motivate them and giving them a chance to reform their self and take life serious. <laughs> <laughs> Let's listen to what some of the youth in other parts of the country have to say about this topic. So I'm in the person of Futiba Pola called a student of Mankesim Senior High Technical School. I'm 19 as of 19 years of age and then I'm connecting from Kokom Lemle. Okay, so the stuff that prevents a lady from returning back to school after birth is, you know, some youth are very nervous and then some are very shy of their friends. So just imagine a young lady getting pregnant. It will be something else. She even thinks she has disgraced herself and then her family as a whole. Some parents and some teachers can help um, an adolescent parents to go back to school by, you know, educating the person and then giving the person this vigor or this, this courage to just get back to school and study for the future. How can we as adolescents support our peers who give birth to be comfortable when they return to school? Do you think adolescent girls and women should have control on when they should get married? Why or why not? Do you think adolescent girls should have control on when to get pregnant? Why or why not? Add your voice to the discussion by sending in your comments via video or text to all our social media platforms. Also, visit or download the GHS YMK app on Google Play Store or App Store for more information. And talk to or chat with counselors online. You may also visit the nearest GHS Adolescent Health Corner or locate a facility through the GHS YMK app. Now, let's see what's next on What Does YOLO Mean To Me? Make a date next week for another exciting episode. My name is Gali, I play Araba and I'm your host. Also, to enjoy a good life in this COVID-19 era, we have to be cautious to stay safe. Always wash your hands with soap and running water. Do not hug or shake hands. Use hand sanitizers. Avoid touching your mouth, nose, face. And ensure you maintain a physical distance of about 2 meters between you and others in public. Avoid crowded places. My name is Quintana, popularly known as Emily. My name is Nana Manpofwa and I play the role of Ariana. My name is Kevin Boone and I play the role of Mark Anthony in YOLO. My name is Jason Edward, I play the role of Psycho. My name is Lola Likwashida, I play the role of Anne. My name is Ivan Edumwa, I play the role of Abrantier. My name is Aaron Adachi, I play the character Cyril in YOLO, aka the Mama's Boy. I am Akosia Estiedwa and I play the role of Tilly in YOLO TV series. My name is Chief and I play the role of George. My name my name is William Odate Lamte. I play the role of Flex. Zamzeng. My name is Christabel Ewa Mwabe. I play the role of Lydia. My name is Etty Betty and I play the role Yasmin in the YOLO TV series. My name is Dilav Agas. I play the role of Odenche. Remember to always live a good life. Good life, live it well. Good life, it's an everyday thing. YOLO, you only live once. <laughs>